Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, let's start. Thanks to one of your colleagues, uh, I had an error in uh, one sketch that I had for the uh, Kepler's equation in the elliptical case. So none of the equations change. Everything we've done is correct, except the sketch I used to build uh, uh, the derivation of the eccentric anomaly at, the, uh, at a, yeah, an error that one of you found. Thank you for that. I'm glad that you guys are watching what I'm doing. So if this is my original elliptical orbit and this is my focus or the attracting body and here I have my spacecraft, uh, I don't know what I've done, but the right way to do it is the following. You go from, so this is your R vector, right? You go from M2, the spacecraft, you go vertical up, vertical with respect to the line of ups, And that defines uh, this point Q that intersects the circle of radius A. This is the center of the ellipse. The radius of the circle is obviously A. And then you go from the center to Q, okay? And that is my eccentric anomaly. And this is my true anomaly. And now if I look at the distance CV, now the equation that I gave you makes sense. The CV is either, this distance is either uh, A cosine of E or, so if I look at the projection of this radius all the way down, uh, or it's AE, the distance between C and F plus this little piece here, AE plus uh, R cosine of theta. So those were right, it's just the sketch was not right. I think I probably had the, uh, this radius that was going from C through this mass, uh, the spacecraft, and in that case, those relationships don't work. So this is a right sketch. Uh, thanks to your colleague who found this out. Makes sense? Uh, okay. So let's finish on the different types of expressions that we need. I don't know why I always start. I know, I know, I know. It's my, it's, it's my bad, my bad. I'm not saying I'm supposed to do it. I always erase the last, the last thing that I write. I'll leave it alone. So let's finish, actually, why you copy that. On uh, the, uh, there are other ways to find to find uh, the position as a function of time for still a closed orbit, and then we'll move quickly on the other two. There are two ways. There are approximate solutions. The first one is they're both through serious approximations. So the first one is called Lagrange series, and I do not expect anyone to memorize this, but you need to know that it does exist. So an approximation to the solution, well, this is actually the solution uh, for the eccentric anomaly would be the uh, mean anomaly plus this infinite series <coughs> of powers of the eccentricity. This gentleman found this out, and the an coefficients are given as 1 over 2, it's a long one, okay, k goes from 0 to floor of n over 2, I'll tell you what that is in a second, of minus 1 to the kth power times 1, and minus k, factorial of that k, I'm almost done. And minus 1, sine. So, of course, I think we all agree we don't want to memorize any of this. But, um, so this is, this is a product. I just didn't have enough space, okay? So this would be a solution for the eccentric anomaly, which is a, an exact solution if you were able to actually compute this series to, you know, the infinity, which we never do. We always truncate at a few terms depending on how accurate we want this to be. And this will be the, uh, this coefficient a n. So this is a closed uh, form solution, if you like. You don't need to do any numerical iteration. You don't have to solve for a, an equation to, that you want to zero out, which is what we do numerically. Um, and uh, one thing we need to know is that this solution has a limit called Laplace limit. Yes. Is 
that yeah. It's it's this it's this. So it's the mean anomaly. <coughs> M E mean anomaly for the uh, ellipse. So this tells me that uh, you can use that, bless you, up to this eccentricity and I don't know how many digits you want me to give you, blah, blah, blah. There is a specific value. So this approximation is okay up until this eccentricity. And actually, if you start having eccentricities that exceed this value, this series does not converge anymore. It diverges. It doesn't give you anything that is reasonable to use. Why do we care about this? Um, will I ever have this in a test? Maybe I can tell you just do the approximation with Lagrange series with n equals 2 or 3, which means that you decide to truncate this and you can compare how accurate it is compared to the actual numerical solution, which is the true one. Uh, that could be a simple exercise. You can do it in MATLAB. But the point of having these solutions that don't require numerical iterations is that many spacecraft may have very limited computing capabilities to the point that even an F0 function like the one that we're using to solve the Kepler's equation may not be a good idea on board. Uh, small satellites, uh, yes. Oh, I like space station well, uh, small satellites, but but many space. Well, I'm not aware. Let's put it that way: of spacecraft that have iterations as part of their onboard software, except Kalman filters, maybe. But if you are asking me, would you put a, something like an F0 function or? An OD45 on your satellite, I would say, in here, probably not. Because, because, especially on a small satellite, the computing capabilities are very limited. Forget about a laptop, forget about a big computer. And, and, and also, the, uh, the chances that your <coughs> algorithms may not converge, it's, it's too much to take. Yes. So you want simple solutions. Yes. No, it's mostly the fact that. Now, these days, things are changing, but mostly technology that goes in space, if it needs to be space qualified, it's like 10, 15 years behind. That it's always been the case. Think about the shuttle that just retired. It, that, that stuff was pretty old. Uh, it was still working, but um, and, 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 it's, and it's mostly a matter of having things that work rather than being uh, efficient uh, and maybe optimal. So you would rather have something simple on board that you know it always works consistently rather than fancy numerical that will give you the optimal solution but may fail in some cases. So it depends on how many chances you, you can take. But if you go to the field of academia where we do small satellites, uh, I don't even know the microcontrollers that we have on board. Uh, what is it, Caesar? It's MSP430. I don't know what frequency they go, uh, but uh, they, can, they cannot do much. And if you only have one microcontroller on board that has to deal with the management of power, measurements from sensors and other things, Having iterations is probably a very bad idea. Yes? So this is uh, possibly a stupid question, but yeah, when you no. said like n equal to uh, 2 or 3, we truncate the last, so just take the first 3 an terms? Yeah, you decide how many you want to have. There's a bunch of examples in the book right after they give you these where they show you, even with plots. Um, actually, you know, my computer is now working. I can show you how these series behave when you start changing the. Uh, the uh, number of terms that you keep in the uh, approximation. Let me see where that image is. Yeah, I found out that I actually had to give the MAC address to the IT people so that this thing could work. What is the upper limit? 0.6627 for the eccentricity, so what? Oh, floor, yes, floor. The floor of n over, uh, over 2 is the uh, closest, smaller, Integer. So if n is you know five, five floor of five over two is what four, <coughs> and I think there is a floor function in MATLAB as well. It does. What did you say the floor was again? Sorry. It's the closest uh, lower integer. So n over two, n is an integer. So you divide by two. If it's of course if it's uh, you know it's four over two, it's two. But if it's five over two, it's four. Or if it's seven over two, is whatever. No, it's the smallest lower. So 5 over 2 will be 2.5, you just do 2. And you know what? I just, you know, I want to make sure that I'm telling you the right thing. So let's do it here. Why is it not showing now? 
Oh, no, 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 that's, that's working, it's working, everything is working. I am online, it's working. This was working before. So it's going to work again, right? Yeah. What did we say, 5 over 2? Yeah, it's 2, yeah, that's, yeah. Divide a number times 2 and get whatever you get. Go to just the, the integer part, basically. It will show up eventually. Uh, okay, there is another, well, that loads. There is another solution that actually doesn't have that issue of the limit. So after 0.6, eccentricity of 0.6, that doesn't work anymore. It starts diverging, it doesn't give you a solution anymore. You must be kidding me, I fix one thing and I break something else. Really? It's on, right? The projector is on, I can see it from here. Yeah, it's on. And I have laptop selected, so... Okay. Let me give you this other solution here. Yes. Victory. So that's floor of 5 over 2, it's 2. So basically, you, you just take the integer part of, what, of that, that fraction. Uh, there is another approximation through what they're called Bessel functions, where E is given by mean anomaly ME plus another series that, of course, you choose when to truncate, uh, 2 over N. This JN is the Bessel function that I'm going to define in a second. Sine of N M E and then J N in general uh, of a variable X is also another series. So again the calculation problem the iterations problem may be one reason why you may want to have these approximate solutions especially on board the satellite and quite frankly in general if you have something that doesn't require numerical iterations and it gives you the right answer or a answer, an answer that is good enough something that is quick and analytical it is always to be preferred in my opinion than doing iterations um, so here, here is uh, an example of mean anomaly so this is, now this is already with Bessel, no, yeah, this, this should be the previous one, the Lagrange solution case. So um, eccentric anomaly and mean anomaly, so this is the solution that you find uh, in black is the real one that you would find point by point changing the mean anomaly um, uh, with the numerical you know, solution of the Kepler's equation. And as you see, the uh, with n equal, so this is the case when the eccentricity is 0.9, so it's already above the limit. n equal 3, yeah, it's there, but as you increase the number of terms in the series, it actually gets worse. Yes? Like, what is this chart like showing? This is showing uh, this function right here. <laughs> I can move the screen, right? <laughs> the Lagrange series solution, so that's your x-axis, as a function of the mean anomaly, right? But it is for a case where the eccentricity is 0 0.9. So we're trying to solve, we're trying to solve always the same equation. Uh, this equation, ME equals capital E minus E sine of E. And, and someone told us that a solution for capital E may be given by a series like this, right? But of course, no one is going to do a series until, you know, with infinite, infinite terms. So you decide how many you want to retain. And this is just showing you that when the eccentricity is above that limit, 0 0.66, etc., where for a lower, for a case where the eccentricity is lower, increasing the number of terms in the series should give you more accuracy. It should be close to the actual solution. Again, the black the black line is the actual solutions. As you change the time, which is mean anomaly, this is the corresponding eccentric anomaly. Remember, mean anomaly means time. I want to know where I am at that time, and it gives me a capital E that I will, if I want, uh, transform into a, a true anomaly. So the black line is the real solution, and the, uh, let's see, the blue one is with the Lagrange series with three terms in the series, and the red one is when you have 10. And of course it's worse. The curves, they just don't look like each other. 
it's it's just to know it's just to know so in real life what you would like for example you would like to know at this particular time and again mean anomaly means time where am I so you you input time and you want to find the position which is eccentric anomaly slash true anomaly right so this is just covering all possible values for time from 0 to 2 pi um, for uh, an, an eccentric, eccentric orbit of 0 0.9 which is pretty eccentric it's almost a parabola except uh, well, well instead this is the case where I am right below uh, the Laplace limit you see uh, same black is the re real solution blue n equal 3 and then uh, n equal 10 is the red one you don't even see it because it's on top of the black one so that is if you're below that eccentricity it does it does converge the more terms you can have which means that you're on board, if you're doing this on board for any reason, it means that your computer has to do more of these calculations. Which again, may be an issue. With one small microprocessor that has to do other stuff, not only um, solving for the uh, Kepler's equation. And then, I believe this is uh, Bessel series solution, yes. This is just even pushing it to almost a parabolic uh, uh, orbit 0.99 n equal 3 it's okay n equal 10 it's better so that is probably what you want to use uh, but these are the available solutions if you don't want to do an f0 as we've done on the Kepler's equation I thought it was good to know that there are alternative solutions and uh, again in real life you're not going to go to infinity of course any questions about this let's move to parabolas real quick parabolas are pretty nice there's no iterations, no numerical solutions needed. I'm sorry. I would. Uh, I mean, it depends. I by just looking at the expressions, I don't know which one is more complicated to compute. It's probably this one because this, to me, looks like I have a Bessel. I have a series here, and then I have to stick it in here, which is another series. So this is probably more computationally intensive than the other one. So maybe the other one up until 0.6 eccentricity, if you don't expect more than that, maybe you're better off using that one. Uh, but believe me, we're used to computers like the ones we, we have. Uh, things that you can do, for example, on small spacecraft are not that fancy. Um, so here we do OD45 integrations, numerical integrations, all these nice things. Those require calculations. And every single line of code that you have, it's removing something, some other instruction that you can execute. Like Monitoring the power coming from the solar panels, for example. Yes. Computation capabilities. Oh, small size. A cube size is uh, this this size. We're talking about a box that you can keep in your hands. One U is uh, ten by ten by ten centimeters. What is it? Three inches. Three inches cube. A three inch cube. Yeah. So universities, by this at this point, not only universities are developing cube sets. Um, and, and just because there is, you know, a benefit in going small and it's cheaper, uh, you know, the, the computers on board are smaller. And also, those, those are also, for the most part, not designed to last very long. They're not radiation hardened, which means that eventually all the electronic, all electronics on board are going to fail. So, the, the, you know, the instructions that you can execute on board are really limited. So, for... Um, Parabolic orbits, real quick, and then I'm going to be quick as well for uh, the hyperbolics because we have done it once with all the um, trigonometric functions, but uh, I don't want to redo it uh, for hyperbolic, yes? Are cubesats stuck in the orbit they're in, or do they have like a little mini parabolics? So this is the deal with cubesats, uh, at least in the US, if you don't have a deorbiting system, which means you can bring it down when you're done with your mission, you cannot go above 600 kilometers because they want you to burn into the atmosphere within 25 years. They don't want stuff to be there forever. And that's the limit because there is still some atmosphere. So eventually you will come down and burn into the atmosphere. So I don't know of any CubeSats that have gone beyond that altitude. They probably have, but they're probably classified and no one knows about that. I, I, I don't know. But most of the CubeSats don't have a propulsion system or a system to decay once the mission is over to make sure that nothing remains up there. Because you know, if you're outside the atmosphere, you're not coming back. There's nothing really that brings you down. And so there is a bunch of um, 
atmospheric re-entry systems that you can actually buy these days, like big surfaces that deploy at the end of the mission. They increase your surface area so that your drag force is much higher and your satellite goes down quicker. There is a bunch you can find. Uh, I think one of them is called AELDOS, A-E-L-D-O-S, something like that. It's an acronym, I don't know. There's a couple out there that you can buy. You can put them in the back or the front of the satellite, and when, once you're done, you just deploy and the satellite comes down. So I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any CubeSats that are space junk, but I wouldn't be surprised. There is a lot of junk up there. So uh, for the, uh, if you go back at the, those very nice formulas I gave you for the three cases, the case for a, uh, an eccentricity of one would be h squared uh, I'm sorry, mu squared over h cubed t is equal to, well, of course, it's the same integral between 0 and, and theta of d theta 1 plus, in this case, I don't have the e, or the e is 1, right? And we said last time that this has a solution, which is the following, uh, plus 1 over 6 tangent cubed of theta over 2, as we've done for a, the ellipt elliptical orbits, we call this the mean anomaly uh, P of the parabola. Of course, here we don't have a period anymore. While for the uh, eccentric orbits, Me, recall this was 2 pi over the orbital period times T. Um, in this case, that's what it is. You just don't have T. You don't have capital T for an open orbit. And so uh, this means that MP is that. And uh, this is, if you, if you say that x is tangent uh, of theta over 2, this is a cubic equation to solve. And this equation, so in other words, uh, I don't want to bring that up, should I? Let me use this side. So in other words, that equation becomes, um, let's see, becomes 1 over 6 x cubed plus 1 over 2x, if you want, minus mp equals 0. And this does have a solution, which is the following. It's not that bad. And we should be able to compute it ourselves. It's a cubic equation. And p squared plus 1, this is under cubic root plus minus 3mp plus square root of 3mp squared plus 1 to the 1 minus over 3. And if you don't trust this is a solution, just substitute it in there and see if it works. So that, has a, that, that, is, that is done. You don't have to do any numerical iterations here. In other words, you give me the mp. Again, mean anomaly means time. If you select time, other than this constant in front, it's like selecting MP. And so once you have MP here, you can actually just substitute and get your uh, true anomaly. Done. So for a parabola, it's pretty straightforward. Nothing else to say. Yes? Why again is there no um, T for parabola? Capital T? Yeah. What is capital T? What do we call that? Period. period. OK. Is there a period for something that doesn't repeat itself? It doesn't repeat itself. It just goes away to infinity and it stops eventually, costs to infinity with zero relative velocity and never comes back. So that's it's, it's an open it's an open curve. Yes. So MP is just time. Oh. Yes, it's the true anomaly. This is the not true anomaly. So this is called the uh, mean parabolic, if you want, anomaly. It's the same. It's just nomenclature, that's how people call it. It's this thing. It's mu squared over h cubed t. And so you come to me and say, uh, I am on this parabolic trajectory. Where am I going to be in 10,000 seconds? You just substitute 10,000 here. You hopefully have h and mu, of course. And you, and you can right away tell me what is theta. Well, do the arc tangent multiply times 2. But that's, that's what you have to do. Yes? If it just goes off, how do you have like, an average? When it just goes infinity, the anomaly? And average, there's no average, yeah. Average for what? 
Well, you say mean parabolic anomaly. Oh, that's what it's called. In fact, it's an abuse. It does make sense for the closed orbit. And I think your book does say that as well somewhere. It's just that that's, that's how it's called, to make, to make you know, the treatment of position versus time in that chapter consistent. That's what people call it. It's not really an average. It's, no, there's no average there. No, this is just time. It's time, so you can call it time. And the same for a hyperbolic orbit. We, we call it M, but it's not, there's no mean. Yeah. OK, any questions on this? And then I'll give you the solution for the hyperbolic case, which, again, requires numerical solution. But I'm not going to go through the hyperbolic trigonometry that is involved, because we have done it already for the uh, ellipse, and I don't think you guys are interested. Uh, and I'm not either. I want to know what I have to do to find my position on the hyperbolic orbit. The derivation is the math behind it, and it's not that much different. OK, so for the uh, hyperbolic case, just to refresh, we have, just because it's nice to copy huge expressions on the board, this is what we have. Now, theta, uh, I'm sorry, e is greater than 1, and so this gives you 1 minus over e squared minus 1 e sine of theta over 1 plus e cosine of theta minus 1 over square root of e squared minus 1 that multiplies, so this is a times, the natural logarithm, I don't know if you remember this, of this uh, very nice expression minus okay all right so the same the same happens here um, so this will be equal to what it's equal to what we had before is still mu squared over h cubed t. So people multiply times this. Um, and call this the um, mh. Yeah. And I'll just give you the solution that you need to stick into your numerical solver. Uh, actually, it's not exactly. There's, there's some intermediate steps involved. Um, so, mm, mm, yeah, there's some intermediate steps involved. This is actually to the thir 3 over 2. That's, that's the actual e hyperbolic mean anomaly. And as one of you said, there's no, there's no mean here. There's, that doesn't really involve any mean. It's, it's again, it's time. These are all constants. The eccentricity is whatever it is on your orbit. Mu is given, h is given, that's a, a, mh. So the bottom line of all this is uh, <clears throat> you get an equation that it's very, very similar to what we had. So we call this Kepler equation again. It's just that it's for a hyperbolic orbit. So mh is equal to e sine hyperbolic sine of f minus f. And f is, as far as we are concerned, I'm not going to even bother describing that because while the eccentric anomaly for an, an, an eccentric orbit had some geometrical meaning here, I don't, I don't even, it's an, it's an auxiliary variable. That's all we need to know. So this is an auxiliary variable. And it does have a relationship, of course, with theta. Otherwise, why would I choose to use something else that is not theta? Uh, let me see if I have the right code to show you later. Yes, I think I do. Hmm. Okay. Right, yes? You want to know what f is? I have it here. I was trying to skip that, uh, but we can. I can define it. 
the, the steps to, to get to this equation are, are, is what I'm going to skip, but uh, I can... Uh, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll, I need to draw the hyperbolic orbit, though. Um, so F, if these are your asymptotes and this is your real trajectory, the other side is, of course, the uh, vacant uh, hyperbola. So this is the definition of F sine, hyperbolic sine of F is Y over B, where, okay, I have to build this. Uh, let's see. This distance here is B, so this is your perigee, and you go vertical to the line of apps, this distance is B, and then, uh, let's see, this is your R vector, of course, and so your distance uh, of the spacecraft from still the line of apps is, is Y. That is the definition. It is just a substitution of variable that you do to solve to rewrite, as we've done for the eccentric orbit, to rewrite this monster here in a more manageable way. Yes? So the mean hyperbolic anomaly, is yeah. that hyperbolic sine of f, or is that sine of h times f? Ah, thank you. Hyperbolic. Hyperbolic sine. Do you remember what that is? I'm going to raise this. I don't even care about this, to be honest. <laughs> uh, this is where we start from, and then... We, we introduce that variable, hyperbolic sine of some angle f. I can't even draw that. It doesn't, it doesn't have a, an actual geometrical counterpart. Um, what is the hyperbolic function? Remember? No? You don't remember? And then the cosine, hyperbolic cosine, is the following. And then we also have the property that cosine hyperbolic sine squared of x minus hyperbolic sine squared of x is equal to 1. But again, I, I, I do not care about all the steps that go from that formula I just erased to, to basically defining this intermediate variable and how you get this one. That's the one I have to solve. They're very similar in substitution. They're very similar to what we've done for an eccentric orbit. Now, what is missing here? So, what is the problem? Sorry. Now you're fine. What is B? Oh, yeah, what is B? B is this, this length. If you are, this is perigee, and you go, vert, this is the line of apps, okay? And you go up. To, uh, from perigee to the asymptote here, um, point Q, this distance, PQ, that's B. Uh, okay. There's really nothing I, I really want you guys to spend too much time other than knowing that this is the final expression that you need to solve. Now, if you want to know how you get here, you can do it. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, we're fine. We've done it for the eccentric orbit. We don't need to do it for this one. What is missing now? So the procedure is still the same. If I give you a position and you want to find the time, that means I gave you a true anomaly. So what is missing here? I need to find the relationship between theta and f, the same way I've done it before, right? Can I erase this? <coughs> Where? No. <laughs> f cannot be in this sketch because, as I said, there's really no geometric, you know, there's no angle that I can draw that I can call f. That's why I wasn't really spending too much time on that. Because for eccentric anomaly, I could see it. For this one, not really. So what is the relationship between the true anomaly and this f? You can call it eccentric anomaly, but it's really an abuse. It's not that bad. This is the relationship. e plus 1, e minus 1, tangent, hyperbolic tangent of f over 2. That's it. So recall what we've done for the eccentric uh, case. Eccentricity less than uh, 1. We have defined an auxiliary variable. In that case, it was the eccentric anomaly. It, it was something that we could plot on that sketch. Not in this case, but that's okay. And we found, in terms of that auxiliary variable, an equation that we need to find, uh, for which we need to find uh, the e in that case, numerically. It's the same story here. So if I'm giving you theta, 
if I'm telling you, okay, my satellite is this is a this true anomaly, well, you compute f from here, inverting that expression. Of course, the hyperbolic tangent is the ratio of these two, sine over cosine. Substitute here, find a match, mh, and then you have your time. Now, the, the numerical counterpart of this is that I'm asking you for where are you at this time, then you're doing the opposite. You compute mh, you go here, there is no analytical solution for this. You stick it in your f0, as we've done before, and I'll show you with, with a different piece of code that I have. Find f, numerically, go here, invert this, do the arctangent multiply times 2, as we've done before, and then that's how you find your theta. So that's why I wasn't really bothering going through the steps, because the procedure that practically you have to follow, once I give you a position and I want time, or vice versa, it's, it's the same. Yes? For a parabolic or a hyperbolic orbit, theta is never going to actually reach a value of 180. No. Correct. No. In fact, in this example, I think I have the extreme case that you can find. Um, so how would you measure where you're, at some point, isn't your satellite going to be so far away? Yeah, it's infinity. It's, it's, no, it, it's an asymptote, so your theta is going to converge to a finite number. So that's exactly the example I have here. I have an hyperbolic orbit. I think the best is just looking at an example. And, and I, 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 I enter a, a huge value for time. What is this, 10 million seconds? You could probably enter infinity. I don't know if it will work with infinity, though. Uh, and so if I even, let's, let's stop here. Let's, let's not do the... Uh, numerical part. So this is the usual thing that we've done so far. I give you a position, I give you a velocity, find h, find e, and guess what? This e is pretty big. Well, it's more than one, so this is definitely a hyperbolic orbit. And what happens with the hyperbolic orbit is that your position goes at the most at this true anomaly. You don't exceed that because you're going to get closer and closer to the asymptote and you, you're not going to be past that, that, uh, that angle, right? So these are the asymptotes, this is the line of apps. Uh, basically, this is your theta infinity, right? Right here. So yes, absolutely. In this case, you actually, the theta infinity, we, we, uh, we show that uh, it's between 90 and 180. There's no, you can increase the eccentricity and, may, and, and, and push this to, uh, to get pretty close to 180. But then eventually it becomes like shooting something on a straight line. That's, that's what happens. And so in this particular case, okay, I, I computed the usual suspects, you know, H, E, the norm of E. Now, of course, the apogee here will be a negative. So to find A, the semi-major axis, uh, which is kind of an abuse for an hyperbolic orbit, but we still do that. I have to do the absolute value of RA. We've done that. And then the theta infinity is the arc cosine of uh, 1 over the eccentricity just convert it into, into degrees in that case. And then I'm trying to solve um, exactly what I gave you here. So this does the same exact steps that I had for an eccentric orbit. You give me the time, you compute the uh, main anomaly, because that depends on time. You give an initial point for the F0 solver. You tell it what kind of function it needs to zero out, which is this other function here. Kepler hyper, which seems like a, I don't know, Kepler on drugs, I guess, <laughs> right? Okay, so you, you, you solve that numerically. Uh, this is going to give me, yeah, I called it eccentric anomaly. You just call it F. Uh, it's, I, I should change that name. Um, I just didn't want, I don't know if it's going to work if I put an F here as well. Probably does. But anyways, it does find F, whatever that is. Um, and uh, now I, I convert that just to show it to you. So it's printing out on the screen. And then I go and invert that expression up there to find theta. And if I've done everything correctly, this true anomaly in degrees should be pretty close to this one. And in fact, it's getting there. So this is the maximum you can get. If you are on a hyperbolic orbit, your, max, your theta infinity is given by that expression, and you're not going to pass that. Because that's your direction as you go to infinity, as you converge to the asymptote. So it, it is making sense to me that this is, you know, this is uh, where it, this is going. If I increase this even more, it will probably get closer. If I put zero, hopefully, 
I don't know what happened. Yeah, true anomaly is zero. So the, the story is exactly the same as for the eccentric, eccentric orbit, except here there's no period. You're not, you're not going around. Same for the parabola. Yes? So for all of these orbits, is it safe to assume that we can have our initial guess of zero? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as we discussed, um, these these functions are monotonic. So there is a there is probably in your book a plot for this as well. Remember that I showed you. Did I show you that? Probably didn't show you that. I because my computer wasn't working. Now it's working. So maybe I should show you until it fails again. Uh, there was this plot right here. So this is, for example, for the uh, eccentric case, right? This is how the mean anomaly changes with the true anomaly. So in basically, these these expressions you can always invert them. Um, and uh, if, the, if you basically have a function which is monotonic, so it only goes up or down, there is only one zero, right? And so you're practically safe giving it any reasonable initial guess. Say that you have a function, so this is your independent variable x, and, and, and this is your function f of x, and you want to find its zero, and the function looks like whatever, this. And it's monotonic, it's only going up or down, it doesn't matter. So the zero is only here, right? So it really, you know, Newton's method, it doesn't really matter where you start, you should converge to that point. A different story if you have something that does this, well then it does matter where you start because you have more than one zero. In our case, all these expressions, that's why we go through the pain of defining the eccentric anomaly, this f, whatever you want to call it, uh, and, and find expressions like this because these things are actually, I don't know if this is the right plot, let me see, are actually monotonic functions and you can invert them no problem. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Should make it smaller. I think there was another plot, uh, fit page, how about that? Yeah, that's the one. No, here, this one, okay. Okay, this is actually the one I was talking about. So this is plotting, well, again, this, the version for the eccentric orbit of this expression, where, again, the mean anomaly, and as you can see, the eccentric anomaly, you change the eccentricity, but you still get lines that are monotonic, monotonically increasing. So you get one zero. In other words, if I choose one value of eccentricity, I'm looking at one of these lines here, you choose one value of time, you just intersect that at one point, there is no other option. So I think, yeah, you, you're fine with x equals zero. You should always give you an answer. Um, any other questions? This almost concludes chapter three as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there is one topic about universal variables. I have to decide if we do that. We have the exam on Monday. Uh, the next chapter talks about orbital parameters. And I think before we do that, it's probably a good idea to summarize what we've done so far. Unless you have questions, you have questions? I know you have questions about the test. Will the, um, will the exam just be chapters one and two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, again, my idea for the homeworks is that the homework should release some of your stress because you know what to expect. So what is in the homework is more or less what you expect from the test, except, yeah, chapter two has parabolas and hyperbolas. So at, at least, you know, be aware of that. So what we've done so far is that we said, okay, from now on, if this is my planet, I define a convenient coordinate system, which we call DCI, right? And in this coordinate system, we looked at this equation, which is a model for the gravitational force. And uh, we have observed that there's a few things that remain constant. If I have an orbit, um, wasn't there a chalk of a different size that I can, you know? I've seen it before. No, okay. Well, we said, uh, there is some vector h that remains constant, and so my orbit is going to be in some plane which is perpendicular to that h, right? Okay? So everything that is going to happen is in the, inside this plane. And so we said, okay, from now on we're going to look at things from above, and we look at that plane from above, which means that h is pointing at us, and in that plane we start talking about the e vector, and so, um, and so we started discussing all the different shapes. That's really all we have done so far. So we have, you know, uh, eccentric orbits, we have parabolic orbits, well, we have circular orbits, 
I don't know if I want to make it tangent to this one. Yeah, why not? And then we can have hyperbolic orbits depending on H and E. Well, E mostly. So everything we've done so far is characterizing the geometry of these orbits, defining for each different type of line a few geometrical parameters so that we can study them in, in the plane. And in chapter three, we have related position with time, but you know, that would not be in your test. But at this point, from this simple expression, we've been able to tell a lot of different things. Circles, ellipses, parabolas, hyperbolas. What, are the same, what is the same major axis? What is the period for the closed ones? Uh, what is the veloci velocity at each point? You can integrate that numerically, or as we've done, you can use true anomaly and, and you have to solve numerically, in some cases, only one equation, which is what we've done in this particular chapter. Yes? Right, so the, what we're going to do when we start talking about orbital parameters is we're actually going to introduce a few other things uh, that bring us back in three dimensions. So right now what I've said is, you know, H is constant, so I'm going to look from above and I'm just going to cons be concerned about what happens in the plane. But, you know, in real life, you want to know wh where things are happening. What is this plane in space? So we're going to talk about the inclination of the orbit, which is driven by where you've launched your satellite from on the planet, um, where the orbit is intersecting. So I will have to do sketches with different colors at some point. If your orbit is you know, intersecting the equatorial plane, at which angle with respect to this direction x that is happening, which is called the right, right ascension of the ascending node. Um, we're still going to retain the same major axis and eccentricity. We're going to define six parameters, six, uh, that allow us to go back now in three dimensions, because that's what we usually have to do uh, once we have decided, okay, this orbit is circular, elliptical, whatever, and I've done everything that I could do in the plane, well, I still want to know uh, what happens from the real 3D point of view. Yes? Also, I don't remember, was an Earth-centered, um, in the Earth-centered one, we assume that the Earth is, ro like uh, the thing is rotating with the, with the, with the, uh, the ECI is centered at the Earth, yeah. but the direction of the axis are inertially fixed. So, yeah, the Earth is rotating, I don't care about that, for now. That, yeah, a, you know, think about rea realistically speaking, this satellite may be there to do something which may be related to you living down here. So the fact that you are on a ball that is rotating is, yeah, we haven't talked about that, but it's probably very relevant. We talk about ground tracks of these satellites, uh, which means what is the projection of the planet at all times, and of course they have very weird shapes depending on your inclination how far you are on the orbit. If we go back to the discussion on geostationary orbits, in that case, it's a point. For, for most cases, it's not a point. <coughs> and so all these things force us to go back to 3D. It's been fun to be in a plane and do all the things that we have done, but that is not enough. Uh, to really relate what these satellites do with respect to us living on the, on the planet. So we'll talk about uh, orbital parameters, not only because it's the, you know, they bring us back in 3D, because eventually towards the end, if we have time, we'll talk about how these orbital parameters do change in time because of perturbations, the fact that the planet is not a sphere, for example. Uh, so they're very, very useful. Yes? Uh, are you going to put the exam in the projector? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, about the exam. I think I sent you guys an email. Please bring your own sheets of paper. I don't think you're going to need a million of them, but bring it. I'll try to bring a bunch of papers too. A stapler, if you can, that would be great. I'm not going to hand out any, anything. I'll just put it here. It's a one page. Is it going to fit in one page or are we going to be. It's going to fit in one page. Okay. I think it does on my computer, so it should, it should fit in one page. Yeah, it's 10 questions. I can only tell you that. Ten questions. Yeah. <laughs>